We are recording Princeton Recuentos, Manuel del Valle Colón, class of 1971. And we have an image that goes with that, that identifies me further. This is me in high school, uh, Brooklyn Technical High School, where I graduated in 1966. What, and let me just open this up with a quote from Pablo Picasso. The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. That said, let's get on. Let's go back a long time ago when there was a different reality. So we're walking it back to Brooklyn Technical High School where early on I decided not to want to be an engineer not to want to be a scientist, but to go into college prep. And to become a member of the most important Puerto Rican student organization in the city of New York called ASPIRA, A-S-P-I-R-A, founded by a very strong Puerto Rican woman, Antonia Pantoja. Note that I've always been surrounded by very strong, smart women committed, organized, involved in community. Uh, Antonia Bantoja, the first time I arrived at the uh, New York City board meeting as a delegate from Brooklyn Tech, I was elected chairman of the Issues and Actions Committee. That was on day one. And thereafter, put on programs, learned about leadership, et cetera but most importantly, learned about organizing and community. And that is a very big deal for all of us. Let me just share for a moment something Antonia Pantoja told all of us over and over and over again. Somehow I learned, she said, that I belonged with my people and that I had a responsibility to contribute to them. I will participate in changing the situations of injustice and inequality that I encounter because they deny people their rights and destroy their potential. All of us were trained to build community and to organize. That was critical. In Aspira, in my last year of high school, a person by the name of Jonathan Fanton, who had been involved in the civil rights marches of the 60s down, to, down south uh, against segregation, interviewed me and another uh, Puerto Rican from Brooklyn Tech, a guy named Harry Laracuente, and recommended us to be admitted to was what was then going to be called the Yale Transitional Year Program. Uh, you would know it if you went to prep school as an extra year after high school, a PG year, a post-grad year. 47 students were brought from throughout the United States to New Haven to learn from a, a group of professors, teachers, instructors, and to get ready to apply to college again. We had all been admitted to college, but they wanted us to be admitted to more competitive elite institutions. Uh, that's where I met my first Chicanos. That's where I met Afro-Americans from Illinois or Alabama, or North and South Carolina, et cetera. That's where I began to uh, head up the um, student newspaper um, and began to continue to work on what I wanted to do thereafter, which was to major in history. When I wrote my application for college, I said at the age of 17, I wanted to write history, make history or teach it, but not necessarily in that order. With that slogan or that mantra, I was driven up to for an interview at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. And there, uh, I hit it off with the interviewer, a guy named Calhoun, and I hadn't applied to Wesley. 
I said, well, I'm not applying if you're not admitting me. And he says, well, you're going to be admitted, just apply. So I submitted an application, was admitted, received a scholarship, and started that schooling with my Yale grade in history, which was an A. And so I was majoring at Wesleyan as a freshman in history, along, do, along as well as doing the other required courses. The second year at Wesleyan, I wasn't there. Now, the first year at Wesleyan, take you back for a second. When I got to Wesleyan, there were a bunch of Latinos, a bunch of Puerto Ricans, Mexican, not organized. So I organized the first Latino organization at Wesleyan. And once that was done, first and second, in fact, at the age of 18, I went over to Ford Foundation, asked for a $17,000 grant for a, a Latino conference, which was funded um, to talk about leadership, to deal with those issues. That being done, my first semester, I was now majoring, I guess, in American studies slash history. Um, I was in New York at the age of 18 with an office on Park Avenue, recruiting and interviewing students for Latino students, minority students for colleges around, around the country through something called the Cooperative Program for Educational Opportunity. Second semester, I was in Spain and in a German bookstore in Madrid found my first history of Puerto Rico, 19th century. I knew a uh, president of a foundation in New York, a very small foundation, Edwin Gould Foundation, called them up and asked for a small grant so I could then teach, uh, so I could then go off to the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras, and take courses on Puerto Rican history and literature and put together a course on the history and politics of Puerto Rico. In that interim, I met two Afro-Americans, Rod Hamilton and Al Price at Princeton. There was a meeting that was arranged by the head of the Crockford Program for Educational Opportunity, a guy named Charles McCarthy Jr. And they were describing to me how they were organizing at Princeton through what they called the Association of Black Collegians. And I said, that sounds great. I think I'd like to go there. So I transferred to Princeton. And the first week I got at Princeton, I began to do what I had done at Wesleyan, but much more methodically. I got together with a bunch of Latinos, which we found on the University of Facebook, and we formed the Association of Latin Collegians, just taking over the Black name and substituting Latin. That's it. But every week, knowing that the semester is normally 13 weeks, we had something new to do in that campus to make sure, A, that folks knew Latinos were present and needs were to be addressed. We had the support of Roberto Barragan, the then uh, financial aid director, uh, admissions slash admissions officer, et cetera. We had the support of Carl Fields, who was not a building, but a person. Joe Moore, uh, and anybody else we could talk to, Afro-American faculty. And that's critical because that begins to put together what our agenda was. Having done the work in Puerto Rico, I put together a syllabus. I was now a junior, so I was majoring in history. And when I had met, when I met my, my the person who used to be my, my roommate, college roommate, uh, who's now L. M. L. Manuel Garcia Diego, then Larry Garcia, uh, from New Mexico, from Albuquerque. I met him at the financial aid office. And I told him everything I had done at Wesleyan, which I've left out here. Um, he says, well, why are you coming to Princeton? And I said, to write a thesis 
and Puerto Ricans and to organize. And he joined me in that effort. At that point, he called himself Spanish from New Mexico. Thereafter, he became Chicano. He had an interest uh, in developing his Spanish. So we got to the Nassau Hall and asked for money for him to go off and study in Mexico and Guadalajara, develop his Spanish. We began to use the resources at Princeton. The first one was a student-initiated seminar. We looked that up in the catalog. We said, we want a course on Puerto Rico. And we said to Peter Wynn, I said to Peter Wynn, you're teaching it. Here's the syllabus, this is what you're doing. Now that's something else, <laughs> you know, somebody in their teens, right? Um, and a whole bunch of things like that began to happen. So the first Ivy League course on Puerto Rico was taught uh, by Peter Wynn, and it was taught at Princeton, not at Yale, et cetera, or Harvard. We also uh, continue to meet. There was a competitor a comp competition in terms of newspapers. There was a Princetonian, something called the Princeton Herald. And we got uh, Larry or El Manuel to write for the Herald. We, uh, El Manuel was at that point an engineering major. He would switch over to history and he's now a historian. Uh, and uh, running the Mexican American program at the University of New Mexico, where he's a tenured professor. But we got him, because he was an engineer, to print the Union, uh, the, the, the ALC, Association of Latin Collegians newsletter on the big computer at Princeton. Now, folks don't know what I'm talking about. Let's see if I can dig this up. One second. This is the cards he would use, cards like this, punch cards with data to put together a Latino newsletter. Now, this is uh, Larry here with the uh, cast. I came to live with him at 321 Folk Hall. Uh, some night, he says, or some afternoon, the door was locked, he couldn't get out. Mr. Engineer uh, said he could jump off the third floor building and then without a problem, well, there was a problem. And he got a cast and he got a, a car to run around the university with after that. Uh, he's the one with the cast, but right to the left of him is Edgar Rios, who I had helped recruit to Princeton who is a Puerto Rican, from, then from the Bronx, and would become a multimillionaire. To the right is Roberto Barragan, deceased, who was critical in helping us organize, and who provided me all kinds of access and information about the university. And right below him is John Carew from Guyana, who taught Afro-American literature and the chair of the Afro-American studies program to his left. We were able to use again, the equad and the big clunker of a computer to make sure people knew we were present and we wanted the first A to be addressed. What was that? Admissions. We needed to get more Latinos in. There was only, the following year, there'd be only one Latina, Marta Hernandez, I think eventually became a doctor. Um, we needed to change the picture at Princeton. We had Daniel Erdman, who was from Mexico. Um, we had El Manuel Garcia Diego and a few others. In 1971, in my class, there was only one other Puerto Rican and he was from the island. 
a guy named Miguel Filipe Samper, you are not familiar with Samper, that last name belongs to the 13 families that used to control Colombia. Different class altogether. So he did not join us in our efforts to organize. So we have that scenario, but the scenario also of bringing in other folks. And if you look here in this photo, you see my college roommate and I at Adelante Tigres. Okay, I think um, we lost sorry. it. Oh, yeah. did you want to pull that photo up? Just let me pull that up for a second. Can you right, see? beautiful. We see it. Okay, and that was the card that he used to create the newsletter, the punch card from Princeton University, and here's he again with the cast. So let me stop sharing all of that. Okay. So uh, prior to Princeton, prior to Princeton, I was a student organizer. And when I arrived at Princeton, because I had been in Aspira as a junior, during my first weeks at Princeton, I was invited and given a scholarship to go to Andover, where there was a conference a training being put together for uh, Latino leaders uh, sponsored by the Harvard Business School. And I got my first Harvard Business case studies at that time. That's important because I learned that, you know, there were things other than standard books that could be used to learn about how things work, what problems were, how to address conflict, uh, and how to get that down in writing. And that was very important in our turn of my development. So my first and second semesters at Princeton was spent on organizing the second semester. We had the Puerto Rican seminar. And of course we did the same, what I had done for Puerto Ricans, uh, El Manuel did for Chicanos. So we put together for the fall, a Chicano, the first Chicano <laughs> seminar at Princeton, taught by an anthropologist, Latino at Princeton. Um, so we wanted to have both equations. We wanted to understand both sides. That's how we began. Um, so why did I go to Princeton? To write that thesis. Did I write that thesis? Absolutely. It's called A History of a, a Puerto Rican Student, New York City, 1940 to 1969. Okay. It's in the library. I have a copy. And is it more, is it anything more than that? There's a thesis. We like to bind theses at uh, Princeton. It's like a big deal. The real big deal is it lasts. That document was created 50 years ago. And in that document, there are, there's a chapter on stats about the Puerto Rican that was used in the lawsuit, which I had an opportunity to work on, called Aspira versus New York City Board of Education. And I had done that research while working for Senator Jacob Javits in New York as an intern for the Senator, who was interested in and held hearings on the plight of non-English speaking children in New York City. So I saw that I would, I could study at Princeton and apply what I was learning immediately to people who had access. It was obvious to me to continue that scenario, I'd go to law school. I'd go back to Yale. I had cut my teeth at Yale when I was 17. That was a big deal. 
but it was at Princeton where I had organized and helped teach and began my interest in teaching. That was also a big deal. Okay. So where did I live? Oak Hall. What were my expectations? None. Princeton was zero sum. Anything we did would be a plus. Zero sum means no Puerto Rican faculty, etc. No Puerto Rican administrators, but we had one Afro Cuban, and that was Roberto Barragan. I had met with the president of the university, Goheen, to try to alert him to the concerns we had. And Goheen was used to meeting with student leaders. He had met with Jerome Davis, one of the leaders of the Association of Black Collegians. And he wasn't really interested in listening to what I had to say. And he put that in a memorandum. What he doesn't know is I got access to the memorandum. And as a result of that, I would never get in and meet with him. And when I got to organizing at Yale, we would meet in group. We would never have individual meetings with the president of Yale after what Goheen did. Really slight who we were and what we wanted. He didn't stand in the way, just didn't help. The person who helped was Carl Fields. The person who helped was Roberto Barragan or Professor Jury, who was over at Green Hall. Uh, they're the people who helped. The people who helped were this, the Afro-Americans on campus, they helped. But in the second semester, we knew we were missing something more. We Latinas began to come in. So you'll have uh, Margarita Rosa, uh, Malta Hernandez, but not many. Women began to come in, 69 is critical language, uh, students, uh, they used to be called critters, those are critical languages, very smart, very bright. Question is, what do you do about Princeton? And what is Princeton to us at that time? It's a Southern plantation. It's a northernmost Southern school. They called their administration building New South. We expected nothing from uh, conservative talk and reaction from them. But we learned one lesson among others, that if you could get Princeton to make a commitment, those commitments could be long, long standing. And so our job was to interact with faculty and make them sympathetic, get them to understand. My thesis advisor was Nancy Weiss, who would eventually become uh, Dean of the College. Peter Wynn would go on to advise, counsel, and assist Sonia Sotomayor in replaying the course we had first developed. So we had the most important thing you need in all of this, allies, people of goodwill, willing to assist and help. And that was important. And the Afro-Americans had an agenda. They wanted a black center, center just like there was at Yale. And we said, we needed something to include us. And so in the spring of my senior year, there was a study in which we participated. Uh, <laughs> Latinos refused to leave the, law, the Firestone Library until there was a third world center, a guarantee of financial aid for students to be recruited, admissions, et cetera. And from there was born the third world center. The university agreed. Bowen interceded, he agreed. There would be 
a structure, an institution. We began to institutionalize. We knew began to understand the importance of leaving institutions behind because we knew we were leaving. And all we could do is leave a path with resources that folks could take over. I went to Carl Fields and I said, we need some money to get together a Puerto Rican studies conference, which we want to hold in Princeton. And he said, well, here's the person, talk to them. Okay, and I don't know, we got, um, you know, 20,000 plus grant. I did the talking, I did the fundraising. Uh, we got it funded and it would be held uh, during the fall after I had graduated from Princeton. But like, the small group that we had would break up and would become a different group. Uh, there were other folks who were more Spanish speaking, so they, want, they wanted less political. So they formed something called the Union Latinoamericana, which involved a person named Ignacio Perez, who had graduated from the most exclusive private school in Puerto Rico, but on scholarship and had come from Puerto Rico and was part of that leadership. I was not. So far as I was concerned, these were simply vehicles so we could obtain the recognition and resources we needed so that the doors would be open permanently for any Latino, Latina to come in. That was the goal. Those were the questions. Was it hard to adjust to college life? Well, no. I'd already been to college at Wesleyan or in Yale TYP, right? That commons at Yale. I didn't, did I, was there, was there a feeling that I had to fit in? No, I did not want to join any eating club on Prospect. I wanted to create our own. And that was the third world center. And we did. And it was ours until it was taken away and uh, cleaned up and formed part of the other clubs or on that street. What were my initial impressions in Princeton? It smelled. There apparently was a cow manure factory somewhere to the other side of the campus. And there was one holy smell that came in when she Wednesdays and it smelled bad worse than anything I had ever seen. So my initial impression of Princeton was, it was a plantation, an alienating environment that compelled students from my perspective to, to beat that environment by organizing, whether it was selling hoagies or organizing Latinos because it was distant and disjointed. It seemed to create conflict and alienation and compel creativity. That's how I thought about it uh, at that time. So questions. Great. Um... This is so much, and I feel like we learned so much in the past 30 minutes. It's, um, it's pretty impressive. Um, I have a clarifying question, if you don't mind, Madwe. Um, Go ahead. I, I thought that um, my understanding was that you had personally founded ULA. Um, no. Is that not the case? Can you explain a little bit about that and your role in that? And then that's, that's one question. I'm sorry, that's one question. And then the follow-up question, I wondered if you could also explain to us um, if you know anything about this um, or have any insights about this, about why it was that there was never an official, or if there was never an official chapter of Mecha on the campus, why was it called Chicano Caucus? And those are the two questions that I wondered about student group life and your roles. Uh, Johnny, the Chicano kind of Caucus comes, well, remember, what, let's, let's look at trajectory before we, can, we answer the questions. The first organization founded, organized, blah, 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 is it's called ALC, Association of Latin Collegians. Horrible name, but we were just being imitators. We didn't want to be creative. 
I said, folks, look, you can call this mofongo if you want. We don't care what to call it. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's what you do. But to be conservative, uh, it was a different Princeton. The first week of Princeton initiation and classes, the, the Blacks addressed the entire incoming class. There was a whole session, confrontation. Talk about putting it in your face. And we said, wow, we're going we're gonna to do that. <laughs> Not that way. OK. We were inspired. So the, what happens in those two years of organization, 69 to 71, is focus on admissions to get new people in so we can go further. By the time that happened, the new folks come in and other folks we attract, and there is a split. And that split means the ALC will disappear, it dissolves, and something new temporary is going to come, but it's temporary. it's temporary. It was clear to me from day one that at some point we would need to enable a Chicano organization. Puerto Ricans would need to support that and Chicanos would need to support a Puerto Rican organization. But that was not the time because we didn't have the numbers. And in, in the only Latino Americana breaks up along those lines. It then becomes Acción Puerto Riqueña y Amigos. And you can find that in the directories in 77, et cetera. And it becomes the Chicano Caucus. That was something from Frank Reed. I didn't name it. I wasn't part of it, but I supported it. And the reason is that I had learned about Chicanos and met Chicano. I didn't understand what they had lost in 1848. I had majored not only in history, but Latin American studies and Afro-American studies. I knew of the shaking earth. I knew of their land grant claims in New Mexico. And it was my belief that we need to support each other. And something which I had not mentioned but let's go back a second. Let's go back a bit. Um, his stages, his identity. So let me take you back. I don't know if I can do this on the screen. Let me share this. Back when we were at Princeton, I'd already learned at Wesleyan about Eric Erickson and his work on identity which he said there were, there were eight stages of identity. So we don't care about the numbers, but here they are. Trust versus mistrust, autonomy versus shame and doubt, initiative versus guilt, industry versus inferiority, but the more number five, identity versus confusion, intimacy versus isolation, general to uh, we got stagnation, ability to generate, integrity and despair. More importantly, when you look at his, when that breaks down into a graph, he said between ages 12 to 18, but I don't think that's right. I, we, it, it goes further than that. There's an identity versus raw confusion, conflict. I think that begins then in adolescence. It involves social relationships and the outcome is fidelity. And there's something called adulthood 19 to 40, which is us, which involves intimacy versus isolation and involves relationships. That's the way he had put it together. But when I got to Princeton, there was an Afro-American professor who I took, Bill Cross, and he came up with a research model. And I said, could I have it? And can I adopt it to Puerto Ricans? He posited there were four stages that we went through. Pre-encounter or pre-discovery before we even knew we were Puerto Rican. Encounter or discovery stage when that changed. Immersion, liberation, we were really into it. And then he said he posited an internalization commitment stage, which might not have resulted in any commitment. One of the results of so much involvement in this identity scenario could be disappointment, regression, and nihilism. You can end up hating Puerto Ricans. 
Another could be a continuation fixation. You could just stay at that emergent strain and not move over. Another, you could internalize the ego factors that had been missing, but no political sophistication. But we wanted the last stage, internalization commitment. We had this in writing. We studied this. We used this as a guide. What I'm trying to suggest to you is that the Latinos there did not just pop out of nowhere without a context, without a focus, without a direction. We were aware. If I jump to the end of this, sorry. In finding the particularity of who we were as Puerto Ricans, we found the universality that tied us to everyone else on the planet. So when asked to answer the question, whom am I? We answer, as we have always done, I am awake. And we became aware and we addressed the issue of identity by being aware by being awake to our nuance and the nuance of everybody else. We had a key, we had a methodology. It wasn't simply partying, partying. It wasn't simply just organizing for the sake of organizing. There was purpose and principle behind what we did. Because what we were doing was creating community among ourselves and among others and promoting making sure the Native Americans, the three that there were, were part of the study in that gave rise to the third world center, making sure the Asians knew, so they can there, making sure that what we were doing is studying. What is wrong with studying? And that shook Princeton to its foundation. For in essence, I read the catalog. Not only did I read the catalog, I have the catalog. Now, I don't know if you went around keeping the catalog. I'm not saying you should have. I'm saying I did. Okay. And when I looked at the catalog, I wasn't in the catalog. That's the catalog. I open it up. I look for it to Miss Princeton, six students of good character, demonstrated scholastic achievement and promise of further attainment. But what is, what's the return on that? What is Princeton? A university that excludes us from its universe. That's an oxymoron. And we knew that. And so we studied what it lacked. But in it, we found, in that same catalog, I found immediately on page 30, they, we had the right as students to petition the Committee on the Course of Study to approve seminars on special topics. And I had my special topic, and it was going to be us. So there it is, page 30. Provision exists for groups of students to petition. I looked at the list. There was economics of the ghetto, radical right wing movements, Black American writers, nothing on Puerto Ricans nothing on Latinos. And I said, okay, we're gonna be added to the list. We got the initiated seminars approved. They weren't published in the subsequent catalogs so far as I, I know. And so we understood that Princeton could be used before they assimilated us, we wanted to assimilate them. So that 
after we left, you know, Sonia Sotomayor would finally make it, she would see, receive the benefits of that. What does that mean? When I was doing work for admissions and doing the recruitment in that second semester, I was told we don't recruit from Catholic schools and not as bright as the students in the private schools or prep schools, even specialized schools. And I said, wrong. Some of our best people are in those Catholic schools and we need to recruit them. And I, I made sure I had contact to Bishop McDonald High School, which is where Margarita Rosa came from. And Cardinal Spellman, which is where Sonia Sotomayor came from. If she doesn't know that. It doesn't matter. What matters is what is right was done. We said no to excluding our candidates coming from Catholic school, at least in the comment that was given to us. We believed that women had to play an important role in everything we were doing. I believe that every man has to become a feminist and every woman has to become a feminist as well. Women need to stop raising machista children, single-headed households by women. And feminists would know better. Men have to stop being machistas and treat women with the respect, as the Shiva would say, there is no God without a goddess and there is no goddess without a God. One defines the other. We are less when we are not present in, all, in each other's lives, in whatever way, fashion, or form. So Manuel, first of all, what a pleasure to hear your story. So many things you shared today. Um, I know many of us don't know, but it's so inspirational. You've taught me a lot. You taught Princeton so much during your time there and beyond. Tell me in this final 10 minutes of our conversation, what is the single most valuable life lesson you learned while at Princeton? That, okay, I don't wanna cry. But the Princeton students I taught would die. In their 20s, and no longer here. I learned to write poetry. I've been writing poetry since I was 17. I have poetry about Princeton. We could deal with that in another session, not this one. Poetry was a freebie. What are you doing? I'm writing poetry. Wasn't everybody? The Puerto Rican. We write poetry. I learned to organize my writing. Peter went, not, not, not good enough. Nancy went, no, no, you can do better than that. I was held to the highest of standards so I could hold others to equally high standard with empathy and compassion. What I didn't know I could learn later. I was in a place which was safe. Remember, I had come from West Harlem, the projects, West 102nd Street, having moved in Manhattan, from East 102nd Street, the projects. And in my projects, Douglas projects, West 102nd Street, Rafael Montalvo went to Princeton a year before me, became a doctor, deceased, airplane accident. And then Cobell came from my projects to Princeton, our realtor now in Florida. 
We had three from our projects at Princeton at the same time, roughly, on the 70s. So what did I get? The opportunity to soar, the opportunity to test, everything Antonio had, Panto had taught us and more. And yet that was the beginning because what I did not know was I would come back to Princeton to teach a new generation in the 19, 1977 to 1988, that I'd be able to share what I had learned. That my 17 year old mantra, teach history, write history or make it was on the mark. That my thesis would help the lawsuit, the most important bilingual education lawsuit in the history of New York. That we could make change without forgetting who we were, why we were, and where we needed to go. And so I continue to teach, which means I continue to learn and continue to share. All of that at every place I went to study. But at Princeton, it settled in. We were never afraid. We were never afraid. And yet, when I read the uh, biography of Daniel Peralta, Padilla Peralta, I see tears, fears, triumph, secrets. The secret of being undocumented, not having papers, and their Puerto Ricans have always stood alongside all aliens in the United States. We don't use the word documented or undocumented. They are our people. And we stand alongside them for liberty and equality with the three Latino virtues, respeto, relajo, y dignidad. Respect, laughter, and dignity. We are all entitled to that. We must all share in it, and we must all promote it. That I could do all of that in the two years I was there at Princeton was great. I didn't, didn't suffer from the microaggressions so many would subsequently have to deal with. Art moment was a moment of building and development. And we continue to do that wherever we go. I'm sorry the young folks I've taught, some of them are no longer here. We've lost enormous talent. And it's a cost to all of this. You know, maybe we matured too quickly. We grew up too fast. Uh, and yet we also party. That's another discussion. Okay, is that is that good? I I think uh, I think that was just absolutely magnificent and beautiful. What about you, Juana? <laughs> um, I gotta say, you're an amazing um, speaker, <laughs> poet. Yes person, professor. <laughs> I'd heard all about you, but really this, you just blew it away, uh, Manuel. Yeah. And I left out Frank Ayala, there's more to go. There's well, this more. is not the end, trust me. Um, can you turn off the recording? Yes. Okay. I, I will put our pause on now, put our recording. Perfect.